there, Cousin here, and welcome back to Always Doing. So I have my May wrap-up part two, unexpectedly split into two, part two, and fewer DNFs than this one. Yay, so let's just get right into it. The first book I have is Prints on Paper by Alyssa Cole. It's book three and the apparent last book in her Reluctant Royal series. All of the stories in this series revolve around characters from a fictional African kingdom and they go out in the world and they end up finding love. The hero of this book is Johan. He is the kind of prince. He's kind of like a half-brother, so he's not directly in line to the throne, but uh, of a fictional European country. And his younger half-brother is in line to the throne. He's like a teenager and Johan is in his 20s, I think. And he, he lives it up. He has a lot of fun and the paparazzi get pictures of him like, you know, in compromising situations with this girl or that girl or that guy or whatever. And um, yeah, he's known for being kind of a wild child. In the previous books, we get hints that there's more to him than this facade, but for the moment, that's what we know. The heroine is Nya. She is the, I believe she's the friend of some of the other women in the series. I DNF'd the first book in the series, so I'm not completely sure, but um, her father, absolutely awful. Um, her father was arrested for trying to poison somebody very important. And this father has in ways concrete and not so concrete also poisoned Nya as well. And I will leave it at that without any spoilers. Johan has always had eyes for Nya, but has covered it up by pretending she kind of doesn't exist, mispronouncing her name on purpose. And, but there's a forced proximity. They both go to a wedding of a couple from a previous book and that forced proximity brings them together and then there is a fake relationship including a fake engagement that obviously this is a romance leads to more there are a bunch of things to like including multiple lgbtqia plus characters one of which their non-binariness plays quite a role in the story another one who is i think they identify as bi that doesn't play much of a role she's like hey yo i'm bi cool and I liked that. Nya's trauma, which I will trigger warning here as emotional abuse and just straight up abuse, the way it's talked about is, I like it because it's never info dumped. There's hints, there's ideas, but Cole trusts the reader to connect the dots. Both Johan and Nya have a bunch of emotional baggage, but their baggage matches. And I think that's just a really good example of how, like, no, you don't have to be perfect to find someone who's perfect for you that as long as your hang-ups and your issues mesh in a decent way where you can help each other instead of setting each other off, that that can be a great, wonderful relationship. There is all of the consent. Nya is a virgin at the beginning of the book and Johan never pushes her, never makes her do something she doesn't want to do. Um, even the fake engagement, he gives her the choice and says, look, I'm doing this partly because it's convenient, but also because I think it will be helpful for you and I'm not intending this, but I am intending this. Would you like to do this? And she says, yes. And how often do you like fake engagements are usually kind of, guess what, we're engaged now. And the other person goes, ha, ah, so like that. One thing I like about Cole is that she'll put in these little things. They're almost like Easter eggs showing how things could be, should be, would be. Um, there's shade thrown at the US prison system at one point. There's positive modeling about how to talk to somebody who may or may not be LGBTQIA+, and how to go about that conversation, especially when they're a young person and they're figuring it out for themselves. So I've been able to list a bunch of small elements that worked perfectly for me. The plot holding it together and the basic idea behind it. While there's good elements, and I like some of the stuff that happened at the end, especially that has to do with the non-binary character, the, the rest of it just kind of was meh. And at the end, I'm not going to give details because of spoilers, but Cole does something that I'm not sure I've seen in a contemporary, kind of this more fantasy type contemporary romance, because I mean, Royals is pretty much fantasy, right? Um, and I, if you've read the book, let's talk down in the comments below, because she doesn't come out forthright and say it, but she gives a lot of hints at something. And I thought it was very brave and very good and something that I hadn't seen before and that I would like to see more of if it fits the story. So yeah, anyway, if you have any idea what I'm talking about, let's gab down in the comments below. 
After that, I decided to read another romance. I usually do have one on the go at any time, and it was Level Up by Kathy Yardley. And this is the first book in a series. I got it as a freebie way back in the day when it was first published, but it ended up getting picked up, I think, by St. Martin's Press? And she's built out the series from here. It revolves around people at a video game company. And I picked up Level Up because I heard it was stinking cute, that it had two roommates who work at the same company, and he's always liked her, but she has never really noticed him. And they get together to work on a charity, like a pro bono project, and then they end up falling in love. And it's short. It's like a novella length. I ended up DNFing it, but this is a it's not you, it's me DNF because my husband works in video games. And while I'd never found anything wrong or I was like, it doesn't work that way or anything like that, I was second guessing the characters. I was wondering about their choices because they're making this video game to help a bookstore in town. And, you know, he says, oh, we should make this kind of game because it's easiest. And I'm there going, I don't think that's the easiest. Maybe if you did a side-scroller instead, but they never mentioned the side-scroller. And then I got thinking about it more and it was just too much. So yeah, I just ended up backing out after 50 some odd pages. It was just, could be great for you. It has great reviews. It opens up a series. The author is a woman of color. There's lots of neat stuff going on here, but just considering my personal situation and my personal the way my brain works, it wasn't for me. After that, I ended up finishing another book for my Japanese nonfiction project, and it was The Bells of Nagasaki by Nagai Takashi, translated by William Johnson. As far as nuclear attacks go, Hiroshima gets all of the stories. It was the first, it was the most shocking, and the way that the American narrative often works for World War II is that we say, oh, then Hiroshima was bombed, and then surrender. And all that in the middle, it's not thought about, not covered. But in there, you have the bombing of Nagasaki, you have Russia getting its nose in the war, like all this other stuff. I wanted to fix that blind spot, so I picked up this book written by a Japanese doctor who was there at the time of the bombing. He's in a unique position to talk about the bombing and its after effects because not only is he a doctor, he is a doctor of radioactive science, like atomic everything. He was studying how to use radiation in treatment and other stuff. And uh, he actually, through his experiments, gave himself leukemia even before the bomb was dropped. The foreword to this book is written by the translator and it provides some great insight about his life because he doesn't talk too much about his entire life. He's concentrating on the bombing and its after effects. So the foreword fills all this in. There's some pictures and it was helpful for that. It also mentioned that this book was banned from being published after the war because the occupying U.S. forces banned almost everything that talked about the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, any medical effects that came after that. Doctors, Japanese doctors, were writing and researching and coming up with all of this valuable science and the U.S. occupying forces said, no, you can't publish that because basically it would look bad for the Americans. This book, however, after they appealed through a system somehow, it was published a few years later. While the book Hiroshima by John Hersey follows six people through the entirety of the time span, he follows quite a few people, all somehow related to him at the university. Um, he works at a medical, it's a hospital, but at a medical university. And what they experienced, he talks about the people, one of whom was lucky enough to be digging in a dugout when the bomb went off and the two who were hauling the hurt the dirt out not so lucky and they died immediately um things the nurses went through their stories what he went through where he was trigger warnings for disaster war stuff and medically kind of descriptions of the after effects of atomic bombs cool cool after hearing all these accounts of the first maybe day or two after it narrows down to nagai and some of his fellow doctors who are still well enough, to, and nurses who are still well enough to treat people and to help people. Most of the hospital goes up in flames and uh, how they ended up surviving this inferno. And afterward, they ended up going out to villages around Nagasaki, which is where many of the injured who were able to walk went and treating people along the way. They did have radiation sickness and this is a new thing, right? Because the, oh, there was only one atomic bomb before and it was, what, three days before? So there's no, nobody knows what would happen. But while they were well enough-ish, 
In the immediate aftermath, they got struck down with a radiation sickness a few you know, you know weeks after that. And he, there's one part where he goes through all of the different things, like all the different ways you die of radiation sickness. Like if you get through the first part, okay, you die afterward from this. And if you get through that, okay, well then some people die afterward of that. I loved that medical stuff. That was totally me. I didn't find it overly technical. I found any of the science, and he talks a little bit about radiation, at a high school kind of level. And in the beginning, in the foreword, the translator talks about how much Nagai's Catholic faith meant in his life and how devout of a man he was and how much it meant to him. So in Hiroshima, I, as one of my quibbles, I said that I was mad how he picked a lot of Catholics to follow out of his six people, and that's holds. That hasn't changed. At the same time, I do not mind that Nagai is Catholic, and I will tell you why. It's because Nagasaki is the place where Catholicism took hold in Japan, and when the Japanese government persecuted Christians, it was the one place where there were secret churches and all of... It's the most Catholic place in all of Japan. If you're going to have a Catholic, they're gonna be in Nagasaki. So him not being Catholic, actually, might have been more weird. So I don't mind this. What I did mind was the preachiness at the end and some of the conclusions he draws. Like, he's like, oh yeah, the bomb. Apparently they were trying to drop it on top of the munitions factory, but the wind took it and it dropped on top of the cathedral instead. And he said that the reason that the war ended after Nagasaki and not after Hiroshima is that God had decreed that he needed that his followers had to be sacrificed. And then after a sufficient sacrifice, i.e. all of the Catholics in Nagasaki, that the war would be able to end. And that those who had died had been the good Catholics and the good Christians, and they had been taken up to their heaven um, by God, and they had been called back. But everyone that was left were the ones that still had to get right with God and still had sins to deal with, and that's why they were left. And this just bothers me. I do not like that at all when you take the acts of men and then add in a gust of wind and then call everything thanks to God. It's just not my thing. But that's the last 15 pages. Other than that, I liked the read. I learned a lot. Uh, I found it interesting about Nagai's life and how things were in the villages and around. And again, I knew basically nothing about Nagasaki. So this was very important. It was a very instructive read for me. It appears to be out of print, as far as I can tell. I was able to get a hard copy from my local library, but if you're interested, you may have to hunt a bit before you find one. And the last book I have to talk about is one of my most anticipated reads for June. It's Natalie Tan's Book of Love and Fortune by Roselle Lim. I apologize for mispronouncing her first name in the most anticipated reads video. I got this as an advanced copy from Berkeley and it comes out June 11th. Natalie has an agoraphobic mother. It made growing up quite difficult. She grew up in Chinatown in San Francisco and she goes away for college and other things. And while she's away, her mother dies. So she has to come back and deal with the estate, deal with putting things together, and she ends up inheriting her grandmother's restaurant. And she has been studying cooking. She went to culinary school for a bit, so she's decided to reopen it and to make good with the neighborhood again. She's not very... she doesn't like them very much, mostly because they didn't help her all that much when she was a kid with her agoraphobic mom, but a uh, seer in the neighborhood tells her she must cook three dishes and to help change people's lives. And then once they do that, once she does that, her restaurant is guaranteed to be successful. There ended up being an element of magic here in that Natalie's grandma, whom she inherits a book of recipes from, was able to change, kind of change people's lives with food. That there are certain dishes you feed people when they need some courage or when they need some happiness or when they're thinking about a tough decision or whatever, there is some kind of dish that you can give them that will make it all better again. I ended up DNFing this at 125 pages for several reasons. One of the main ones was this magic. I didn't think it was very well thought out. It wasn't very well introduced. And it just comes off as weird, not as something truly magical. Sometimes she sees weird things, Natalie, and she doesn't seem to shock her as much as I think it would. Some of the magic's just corny. Whenever this particular handsome guy comes into the restaurant, she's like, um, you know those cartoon characters where they like go all red and there's like steam coming out of their ears and out? It's like that. And it, after a very realistic and kind of down-to-earth opening, 
it wasn't introduced in such a way that made sense. Also, Natalie has the best luck in the world. Like, she needs to go talk to the elder down the street. So she goes there and he runs a bookshop and you can just tell by looking at the shelves that business is not good. And she's like, hey, how you doing? And he's like, oh yeah, no, great, business is fine. Which is what you would expect. But then he gets a phone call from his brother who has another store down the street and uh, that brother is kind of half deaf so they have this shouty phone conversation about how bad business is and she just kind of hides in an aisle until that's over and now she knows what dish she needs to cook them. It just way too convenient and it happened multiple times. I didn't care for the writing very much either. It deals heavily in metaphor and every once in a while one of them would be really nice and I would say, hey, that was a nice metaphor. I like that image. But more of them missed than hit. And there's just so many of them. I think it was an overused device. So sadly, I'm afraid to say that this book wasn't quite for me. I was hoping, because I used to live really close to Chinatown in San Francisco, I was hoping that it would create a lot of nostalgia and um, a lot of like inside neighborhood know-how and it didn't do that either and with all the other issues I had. Yep, DNF'd at 125 pages. So there we have it, the rest of my reading or not reading for May. Have you read any of these books? Are you interested in them now? If you'd just like to say hi, I would love that. Let's have a gab down in the comments. Thank you for watching, subscribe if you're new, and I will see you in the next video. Bye.